Hi, welcome everyone. We are so excited to have you guys here for Sensation Sunday. We have a wonderful, wonderful, and let me get here. We have a wonderful show today. I am so excited. We have three sensational ladies, and it's going to be awesome. We are waiting on one. I think her name is Marlena to get on, but she will be here soon. And I just want to introduce myself and let you guys know I am Nikisha Washington. CEO and founder of Nyla Dene Enterprises. And if you're new to viewing us, Nyla Dene is my daughter. And we started this, um, we started this initiative where we want to encourage and inspire young girls to have a positive self-image through confidence, character, and class, and inspiring them to become future leaders. And we're kind of biased. We want them to become future STEM leaders. But if yeah. they become STEM leaders, we want them yeah. just to just have the tools, the critical thinking, the problem solving skills. Um, the language, the exposure to STEM. So whatever career they choose to, they'll um, be successful in it. And so one of the ways we're doing this is what you see today is our Sensation Spotlight is where we are hosting um, Sensations, which are, hey, trailblazers in their chosen field, whether it's in science, technology, engineering, math, where they're skyrocketing to their highest potential while um, doing it with style and grace. So, hey, Sensations. And hey. Hey. <laughs> so another way that we're doing this is that we are targeting our preschool girls. And we so we have two books out, which is the children's book, Who is Nyla Nova? And this is to encourage young girls to find their science or STEM superhero. And so this shows us how Nyla talks to her family and she discovers that she has this nice, and she has this these STEM skills. And so to go along with that is also the activity book where there's mazes and puzzles and different things. And so at the end of the show, I'll talk a little bit more about it as well. But you can find this on nylodenae.com. So I just have to get that out. So, okay. But we're ready for the show. We're about to rock and roll right now. I want to introduce our two sensations that are joining us. And I know Marlena should be joining us very soon. So. First up, who we, um, if you have not checked out, and I will add her article um, to the actual comments, and um, is Sharice Burton. So if you have not met Sharice, I want to say hi, Sharice, and how are you? Hey, hey, thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. Thank you. And then on Saturday, we had Kelly Knight. So if you have not met Kelly Knight, this is Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Yes, welcome. And I think Marlena is joining us. Let's see, Marlena joins. Okay, let me show her. Yes. Hi, Marlene, are you ready? Hi, I'm here. I'm so sorry about the difficulty. That's I okay. <laughs> you know, technology, we're just happy to have you now. How do you say your name? I just want to make sure I say it correctly. It's Marlena Fitz. Marlena, yeah, Marlena mm -hmm. Fitz. All right. So we have a full house. I had, had four. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hey. we have a good time today. So welcome, Stimsations. Yes, and so we're going to start with our first question. And we always just say, give an introduction, who you are, what inspire, who inspired you to get to this point, and, um, and then we'll get further into the conversation. But this is our introduction so we can get to know you. So once again, we'll start with Sharice. So Sharice, go ahead and let us know who you are and who inspired you or what inspired you to become a okay. Stimsation. Yes. Well, so my name is Sharice. Um, I know you have some of my backgrounds. Um, I'm presently an engineer. I work in the automotive industry. Um, I also hold a PhD in industrial engineering, manufacturing engineering. And growing up, I'm from the Virgin Islands. So being Ooh. around um, my mom, she, a single parent household, she's always pushed me to the next thing and she's also an educator. So she let me you know, dabble here and there and try out different things. And um, being an inquisitive child along with, you know, all of her friends and my different counterparts, whether in the church environment or just being at school, there were always these strong, influential, powerful women in my circle. They were professors, they were doctors, they were technicians, they were into biology. And so they pushed me to try whatever facilities we've had. So I've done, you know, I've been previewed to robotics camps in junior high school <laughs> by these ladies or, um, dog surgery by veterinarians <laughs> and so these women have they've always pushed me like you're pushing your daughter right now to see new things yeah and so it's it sparked that you know love for stem in my heart that propelled me to this i think place in life so all those women who've been around me have been very influential well that is awesome and we welcome you to be mm -hmm. here great and i just love that like you said you're from virgin islands and you have a strong 
community that helped, you know, steer you to this way. And that's kind of what we're trying to do here with this temptation spotlight is letting other ladies and young girls see that, you know, whatever you want to be, whatever you want to do is never too late. And these are different opportunities and different professions that you may not have thought about that you might be really good at. So welcome, welcome. All right, Miss Kelly, tell us about yourself and what inspired you to get to this place. Hey, so yeah, I'm Kelly Knight. I'm a professor in the forensic science program at George Mason. Um, I'm also a STEM accelerator. So my position is kind of interesting in that I, I get a course reduction in order to pursue STEM, uh, STEM efforts. So things like helping to recruit students to STEM, um, helping to retain them because we do all this work to get students to college. And then once we get there, we're like, okay, you're on your own. So at Mason, we have <laughs> have specific efforts in place to help retain them, um, helping to reduce their time to graduation because we all know people who have been or we have been super seniors. So <laughs> trying to help them get out in that four to five uh, year range and then also you know, helping them to get jobs afterwards. Because again, we do all this work to get them in. And then once again, we're like, great, you have a degree and now you're Enjoy it. Right. <laughs> no, They need help getting jobs. So. So I love that I get to do both. I get to teach and I get to do all of those things as well. So as far as getting interested in STEM, my mother was a teacher. My dad was in aviation. He was an air traffic controller. Wow. And they, they didn't force me into STEM. They definitely, um, you know, exposed me to different career choices. But very early on, I kind of hooked on to science. And, you know, if it weren't for them, I probably wouldn't be in STEM because they were really the ones who were pushing me to do different things. They were, you know, putting me in space camp. I was always, you know, like the only little black girl in space mm -hmm. camp. Um, all yeah. these different activities. Yeah. And even when I felt alone, they kept pushing me and encouraging me, even though the, mm -hmm. you know, I felt like the institutional support wasn't there. So yeah. they kind of started it. And then when I was in 11th grade, I had a teacher anatomy teacher who did a crime lab uh, scenario. And that is the specific point that I, I remember getting interested in forensic science. And that was pre-CSI. So <laughs> right. this was before all the CSI shows came out. And just the date, how long ago that was, we were, we did blood typing. So you know that was Oh, wow. But that was my first kind of like, wow, this is, this is really cool. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing your story. And I just want... Our viewers, to, um, we have up to nine viewers right now in, in Steady County. So we just want you guys to say hi if you're watching us. Make sure you're hitting the, the hearts and the thumbs up. And just let us know you're here because we want this to be as interactive as possible. If you have questions, please say so we can continue to keep the conversation going. I'm going to show everyone's name real quick so everybody know who we are. We got a four score. And so before we get to our next guest, we have JT Smith. It says, hey, Kelly. Hey. Hey. Then we have Mia Elliott. She has like hearts and praying hands. So we want to say That's hi. That's my sister. Hi. <laughs> hi, Mia. <laughs> so we have Mr. Nate Washington, who happens to be my husband. So hey, Nate, he's out of town. So I'm glad he's still, you know, supporting from afar. So hey, mm -hmm. look, maybe I got a full house. Yes, we're growing. Yes. <laughs> Yes. All right. So guys say hi. It was questions, but we want to hear about Marlena. Who are you and how did you get to this point and who inspired you? Yes. Tell us, please. Of course. So hello, everyone. I am Marlena Fitz and uh, I am a clinical site manager for ParXL, which is basically a clinical research associate. So in my role, I'm primarily responsible for patient safety. That's number one. Okay. Um, and that involves uh, protocol adherence, um, going to my research sites and making sure everyone is doing everything by the protocol. And that there is um, if there's any uh, issues, then I'm there to um, help rectify the situ situation. Excuse me. Um, so that's what I do in my current role. And that takes me all over the country, which I am happy about. I love to travel. I grew up in a military family, so um, I'm used to acclimating to different environments, which helps me a lot in role. Because as you all know, when you meet 
people, there's different personalities and you have to learn how to work together. So that helps me um, a great deal. Um, so like a lot of you, I started getting interested in science at a very young age. I grew up with a mother that's a nurse and has been a nurse for over 40 years. I also have an aunt that I'm real close with that's also a nurse and she's in public health. And so just I've just always been that inquisitive child. Like, let me know what happened in your day. <laughs> Teach me about this disease and how to treat it. So I've always been interested in science in some way. And so that kind of continued through elementary, junior high and high school. Once I got in high school, I started to seek out opportunities to shadow women um, that looked like me. And luckily, growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, um, you have a lot of those women. Um, so I was spent time at Emory and um, I did a lot of research there. Um, and then when I got to college at Tuskegee, a lot of my professors looked like me. So that was really exciting. And um, I kind of wanted to be a physician when I first started out. But when I got to Tuskegee and met all the professors that were doing research, I was like, OK, you know, they're doing they're doing things. They're, they're getting things done behind the scenes. So um, I decided to switch gears and go into clinical research. So that's how I ended up where I am. Hey, let's see your shirt. I can, let me take your name off for a second. I can see your shirt. Black Sciences Matter. Yes, we love it. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, ladies, thank you for that. That is awesome. You each have such different backgrounds and unique backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is uh, kind of like, why did, you, why did you choose your career? But also, what do you do? Because sometimes we hear clinical research and some people are like, okay, I think I know what that is. But actually, you know, what do you do on your like your job, your day to day and stuff? Because one thing we want to do is try to get people that may be interested in something, especially young girls. And they like, oh, I didn't know that's what that was. I thought that was this, you know. So we want to give them some clarifying um, ideas and, some, you know, let them know what their um, possibly can happen in the future. So why did you choose your career and kind of what do you do on that day? like do it your day to day. And so we're going to start back with Sharice. So I laugh about my career choice because I've changed it a couple of times. <laughs> and nothing, <laughs> nothing to, you know, um, no reason in specific, but engineering is a very broad field. So mm. I'm like, okay, well, I did research for five years at Brookhaven National Lab. I want to be a scientist. <laughs> so I chose um, material science engineering. I was like, oh, but I like people. I talk too much. <laughs> um, and so I went to like civil engineering. I had actually gotten into my master's program. I was like, no, I want to do industrial manufacturing engineering. And so the reason why I love it is because of the complexity of what you can do with it. There's no specific, well, you have to be this to be an industrial manufacturing engineer. Um, industrial has two sides. It's either like manufacturing based or engineering management based. And I chose to do both. Okay. So um, I started off um, as a project manager, engineering management, working in long steel. Um, and then I transferred over to automotive where I do more manufacturing engineering. And so what that is, is um, overseeing the production line for large capacities. For instance, I build transmissions or I oversee transmission builds from the industrial engineering side. So um, F-150s, Mustangs, if you have those 10 gear transmissions, those are the ones that I oversee. And so it's everything from like mixture capacity strategies can be met to making sure ergonomic safety is there, our workers are safe. Um, we're able to see what we're able to meet our capacities. So if we're going from um, transmission to the body stamping plan or to the final assembly or to a truck plan or the Mustang plans that we have enough to facilitate the build to build our productions for that day. So besides that, I do the five-year glide pass as far as, you know, manning our machines, making sure we can meet um, the head counts for how many people we need, just all logistics centered around running this line from more different components. That could be cost studies, capacity strategies, um, any... Um, I've done reliability maintain maintainability, which is like um, supporting our spare parts, our scrubs, um, dealing with our different vendors. So I've done a plethora of different things surrounding the idea of manufacturing. Um, and I love it because I get to talk to people all day long. <laughs> so <laughs> I can walk the plant floor and I see like different people. And while I am doing the engineering work, they're so willing and able and ready there. You know, their mothers, their fathers, their aunts, their uncles, their <laughs> their parents whose kids are in college too. And so, um, like you said, I see people who look like me, sadly, you know, a lot more in that setting where it feels like home. So it gives me a chance to be both corporate based and, you know, deal with them from the business side because I am the business, but still get out there mm -hmm. and get my hands dirty and, you know, walk the plant floor and see who's out there. You know, I was in school while I, um, I worked on my PhD and they were just so amazing about... Um, 
I'm in there at 5 a.m., but they're still talking to me because they know I have things to go do. <laughs> and so that's why I chose the career I did because it gives me a chance to still be human but still have fun. And um, I love math and science. I grew up in STEM, like I told you. So I get to apply what I've learned. And ultimately, I can you know go back home eventually if I'd like, if I want to, which I love as well too. <laughs> home is very far for me, um, but it gives me a chance to build and also give back to my community back home because. Um, when I had gotten to engineering, our university back home is an HBCU also, but our engineering um, curriculum doesn't exist. Yeah, we're the only HBCU outside of continental United States. Yeah. <laughs> Virgin Islands. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I didn't know that. That's the stuff that you don't learn. Like, you know, so that's mm -hmm. why I just because <laughs> I didn't know that until we, we um, went there to visit. And I was like, it's like three or four years ago. I was like, I never knew that. So mm -hmm. for that, I just want to say that we do have um, some people that are watching. So Janelle said, Taron said, hey, sister. So I hey. Did, hey, sister. <laughs> Jasmine Ward said, hello, ladies. And hey, Marlena. Um, hey. The, the, um, our guests that are watching, I have included everyone's article underneath the comments. So if you have not read um, these wonderful ladies, these sensational ladies, articles about their journey because they give even more information in their article please read that mm -hmm. comment on it share it all right please all right so we're going to move on to kelly kelly please one question um why did you choose your career and what inspired you all right so when i had that lab in 11th grade that i was talking about um, um <laughs> that was really the first time after all the science class classes i had had that was the first time I finally had that why do I care moment because yes. the first time I really saw all of these hardcore scientific principles actually applied to like a real life career situation and something that's so cool. I mean, I think we can all agree that right now there's a lot of fascination around true crime shows uh, yes. and the podcasts and all that stuff. And so to know the science behind that has always been so fascinating to me. Um, and as a teacher, it's so cool to be able to use it as kind of like the ideal STEM model to say, hey, here's this science that literally applies to every single area of STEM. If you can think of an area of, a, of STEM, forensic science applies. Like if there's a car accident, mm -hmm. they're going to call mm -hmm. forensic engineers to figure that out. If you have a cybersecurity situation, those are considered forensic people as well. You know, people who are doing the crime scene stuff and doing drug analyses. And there's so many different areas that fall under, under STEM and under that forensic science umbrella. And the fact that that really excites students excites me because, you know, they take the organic chemistries and the, you know, the cell biologies and all these classes and they're like, I'm just, I'm dying. Like, I don't get it. Like, I don't understand why I have to memorize all of these molecular structures. Right. You know? and, and then exactly. to be able to take those students and say, see, it, all of that reading did matter. And then right. for them to see the light in their eyes, it's like, it's an amazing feeling. And so, all of that is basically what got me interested not only in forensic science, but it's why I got interested in teaching because to be able to see that experience with students has just always been such a rewarding moment for me. And as far as what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, so I think, you know, I'm a professor, so most people probably know that on a day-to-day -day basis, <laughs> I'm teaching for the, for the most part, yeah. uh, doing research. Uh, but before I was teaching, I was working full time in a crime lab. And wow. what people don't know is that if you there's two very different sides of forensic science, either you're in the field mm -hmm. or you're in the lab. And a lot of crime scene shows make it seem like we're all one person, like we're yeah. the detective. Mm -hmm. We're going to the crime scene and we're going to go back to the lab and analyze the evidence. And that's not how it works at all. <laughs> I was a lab rat. I worked nine to five in my lab coat, in my cubicle, doing lab mm -hmm. analyses. I never went to a crime scene, never touched a dead body, um, never interrogated a witness, <laughs> never carried a gun. So all of those things. Oh, are, so they just get us. Um, <laughs> oh, they lied. That's crazy. I worked, I worked in the DNA lab. And so any type of biological evidence that was collected from a crime scene, blood, saliva, anything like that, those items mm -hmm. would be submitted to my laboratory. 
laboratory and then we would have to do the DNA analysis on it. So that's basically what we did um, for the most part. And then another thing people don't know, forensic scientists do a lot of, and that's testifying. So we do the lab analyses, but then another big part of our job is to actually go to court and talk about, you know, what, what the results were, how we did it, why we did it, how you interpret it. So a lot of people, you know, they don't really get to see that side of it either. Wow, thank you for that. And it's something I wanna go back to that you said about how you guys are really supporting the students in STEM at your college, because mm -hmm. I had originally went for engineering, but then I changed teaching. But like you said, I didn't have that support. And so mm -hmm. like, you know, you, you can't just say come to college and go into STEM, but then don't put support behind it. And, for, exactly. um, and then there was so few of us at that time, but now I see it's more of us getting into it. And we're, you know, they kind of bond together but it is definitely need that support because if you're going into STEM, which is, you know, not easy by any right. means that you need any support, you need that help, you need that mentor, that advisor that just, hey, yeah. girl, have you done this? I need help with this. So that's Absolutely. awesome. Man. That's awesome. Right. And it's cool to thank you for bringing that about forensics because I love CSI and stuff. And I'm <laughs> so I can't do, I want to do all that. And I, I don't <laughs> like blood and stuff. Yeah. So just to know that I can just be in the lab. I don't have to be out there looking at the dead body, picking off the right. dead stuff. And I, oh no, exactly. But they don't exactly. let us know. But by me being a teacher, I do um to call my students investigators and everything we do with doing problem solving. So like you say, anything that we attack, there's always a problem, and we're trying to find mm -hmm. solution. That's what the basis of STEM is. You know, whatever right. field you go into. And so I'm like, hey, investigators, this is your challenge. And so they're like, okay, what we got to do now? They got their notebooks and they get excited. So you're, not just, you're not just talking at them. You're doing cool laps like that to get right. them involved. So that's awesome. So great, great. All right, Marlena, it's your turn. Let's hear about you, especially this clinical research. I want to hear more. Yes. Yes. Well, great. Excited. I love to talk about clinical research. So um, basically, I work in pharmaceuticals. So I do I monitor clinical trials for pharmaceuticals in hematology, blood or oncology. So cancer. Um, and this involves, like I said, protocol adherence, um, FDA audits, um, you know, the business aspect side of it. But what I enjoy the most is even though I'm not patient um, facing or subject facing, okay. I get to read a subject's history and read their um, trials and tribulations. And I know that if the drug that I'm studying at the time yields a positive result, then I know that that subject's going to have a better uh, way of life. And so that's kind of how I've always envisioned my life being. I wanted to help people and I wanted to help a lot of people. And so that's how I knew clinical research would help me do that because I can study a drug, uh, make sure that it passes and gets FDA approval and therefore it can help millions of people. And so that's kind of like my um, end goal that, uh, you know, like I wanted to be a physician, but um, now I know I can help millions of people um, by doing clinical trials. So um, day to day for me is that I get to remote um, work remotely. And um, <laughs> that is exciting. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you can get cabin fever, but um, for the most part, I work from home. And then when I'm not working from home, I am on the road, which can take me. Um, I can be on the road upwards of 20 days a month, which it wow. sounds really stressful, yeah. but yeah. I have a routine. You know, like, hey, um, like, wow. Right. <laughs> you can do it. it can be like, yeah. Wow. It can be stressful, especially delays and dealing with, you know, people in the airport. For for the most part, I have a routine and um, that usually keeps me sane and that comes from just being military brat. You have a routine and you stick to it and, and you just follow that routine. But I love it because I get to meet people. I get to talk to people. Um, and so you get to learn about different fields. You're like, oh, you do this too. Oh, I, you know. And so it helps me explore those avenues that I never thought that I would um, explore. All right. Well, awesome. Well, once again, welcome, ladies. Welcome, all our viewers. Hey, guys. You guys are saying we can comments like excellent ladies and awesome ladies and wow, indeed. And so it's <laughs> awesome. So, guys, keep up the interaction. Hit those likes and hearts. And we're going to go to our next question. Um, Use our next question, what you like most about your career. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But as your guys were talking about it, you're so passionate about it. We can already tell what you like most. So we also want to talk about if there's anything you can change, what would you change in your career? And I know as I was reading through your article, some of you like, 
I love everything. But then he was like, but then maybe this. So it's always that one little thing. If you can kind of control, you might want to change. So our next question, and let me post it, is um, kind of like, what would you change about your career? Because we've heard like, you know, what you like about it, but what would you change? So Sharice, we're back on you. What would you change about it? I'm going to take this opportunity to be very real if I can. I think the whole gist of your platform is what we would change if we could. It's mm. these fields where we're in all these different fields where we're the minority. You walk in and there's no one who looks like you. So you have right. imposter syndrome. Yes. You have a sense of wanting to do more, but not truly speak your mind because of your environment. So I think more or less, if I could, it would never be my career. I love my career. You know, I love being a female engineer. I love the opportunities to give back to those around me. But what I would definitely change my environment. You know, find a way to either, well, not, probably not either. My biggest thing right now is trying to recruit more on our behalf. Yeah. To find ways to um, feed her to young girls or just to our race in general <laughs> to get into engineering to push for that big three corporation you think you're a little afraid to try for um i know we're often told to start small maybe you don't have to start small so i think if i could change one thing it would be my environment um just finding a way to you know get more of us in there get more of us dreaming and scheming and wanting and pushing and you know going above and beyond to make us the majority as much as possible to open up that pathway for more black female engineers. Yes, that's awesome. And that's something that I know that we all can relate to because sometimes it's not easy being the only one in your class or the only one, you know, in the, in, right. at the boardroom or only one, you know, like, and it's, and it's, it gets heartbreaking, but then it's like, you know, that at least we're carrying on. And like I said, that's what a STEM section is. It's a trailblazer. So you're lighting that trail for the next person and, and I love that in each of your stories as I read that you're, you know, you're gonna reach back and grab the next person's hand and like, come on, let's do this together. So that's awesome. So thank you for sharing that because we all can relate. All right, Kelly, what would you change as a professor in the teaching field? I know you see some stuff. So what would you like? <laughs> I know you see some stuff. And so, well, yeah. first of all, ditto to everything that she said. Um, to my <laughs> knowledge, I'm the only uh full-time African-American faculty member in the College of Science, as far as I know. Wow. Um, and if there are more, yeah. that's even crap. I don't know of them. <laughs> but as far as I know, I'm the only one. So yes, ditto, ditto to that. And there's a need for mm -hmm. our students in the College of Science, especially the women of mm -hmm. color, to be faculty that look like them. And that is one of my pushes right now is we need to, you know, do more to make sure that we're really trying to recruit diverse faces because mm -hmm. all of our students need to be, not just the women of color, but all students need to be able to see themselves see. in their teachers. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Presentation is important. <laughs> it is, and that's what it represents. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would change as far as being a teacher um, and again, being honest. <laughs> Let's be honest, ladies. Yes. The hours, because I'll tell you, Ooh, um, okay. a lot of people look at teachers and they think, oh, they have it easy. You know, their schedules are flexible <laughs> and they've got this time off. No, that's not how it works. A lot of people don't realize, for one thing, a lot of professors teach sometimes up until 10 o'clock at night if they wow. have graduate classes then you may be there another 30 minutes or an hour answering questions that a student has. So I know my husband, he's always like, class ended an hour ago, you <laughs> haven't left yet. And I'm like, no, cause I had 12 students, you know, who wanted to talk yeah. after class. Mm -hmm. And then we never get uh, that real chance to turn off or clock out. Like a lot of people, they clock out at five. Yes. Mm -hmm. But when you're a teacher or a professor, you take your homework with you, or you take your work home with you. You're grading mm -hmm. at home all the time because normally when you're actually at work, you're either teaching or in meetings. So actually doing work at work is not really happening. <laughs> so, you know, you take exactly. most of your home with you. And then yeah. I I think people would never understand the number of emails you get as a college professor. Uh, students will email you at 1150 at night and they will expect the response at 12 o'clock. Now, yeah. I say, to say <laughs> you're not 
you're not obligated to respond to those students, but a lot of professors who want their students to be successful and are concerned about their students are mm-hmm. responding mm-hmm. at one, two, three o'clock in the morning just because it's in our nature. Yeah. We have a really hard time turning it off. So weekends, late nights, you know, that is probably the worst part of being a professor. Yeah. And from a forensic perspective, I mentioned this in my article, but um you know, there's there's certain cases that really get to you. And for me, when I was in the lab, it was always, you know, the cases involving uh, children, the cases yeah. involving the yeah. elderly and people with disabilities. Mm-hmm. You never want to see anybody mm-hmm. get hurt or be a victim. But it's especially hard when you know that those people don't even understand what's happening to them oh, or nice. they're really, really helpless. Those are some of the some of the worst things. Like I remember when I was pregnant and I was uh with my oldest and I was processing baby blankets and you know it just it just breaks your heart like I'm like I'm not trying not to cry over my evidence right now but this is right you know trying your best to um to remove yourself from those types of situations is can be really challenging at times I'm sure Mia Elliott she said absolutely working on weekends and holidays and as a teacher I do that too and so you say it's getting to the point now since there's so much more technology, students are expecting you to use that technology instant. Exactly. So exactly. they're like, I turned it in at this minute. Why is it not graded at, at, at five minutes exactly. later? Uh, I have a life. I'm doing other things. Right. right. I'm a person. <laughs> right. I sent you an email. This is my instant message. You get this? Uh, yeah, but I didn't look at it because, like you said, it's 11.59 at night. So. Right. You know, limits. Limits. My mom teaches, so I'm relating too well to this. Oh, wow. I can imagine. Yes. <laughs> and she's like, I'm sorry, girl. Yes. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> the forensic science. And yeah, babies, that will definitely be hard. Because if you, you hear a right. story about babies, even like, you know, because lately, you know, by me living in Florida, you know, super hot, and there was been like a daycare that mm-hmm. left the child in the car. And, you know, you just like, oh, my God. And then to have to, like, process that, that is just, you know, just hearing it on the news is so heartbreaking and then actually having to look over the evidence and, oh, no, I couldn't do it. So, yes, mm-hmm. yes I can imagine. Yes. All right. So, Marlena, let's hear about you. What would you change? I know she was the one like, I love my career. I don't know if I would change anything. <laughs> so, let's see. Well, I said that I love, you know, challenges make us stronger. They make Ooh, us grow. So. You. I wouldn't get rid of some of the challenges, but of course I would try to alleviate those challenges. So I think um, the one of the well, some of the other reasons why I got into clinical research was to change who the research benefited. Because, um, of course, going to Tuskegee University, hearing about the syphilis study, um, going through my master's degree, hearing about all the terrible things that have happened in research um, and the stereotypes that can be. put on clinical research, especially when it comes to people of color, especially African-Americans. So I wanted to join clinical research to show my fellow African-Americans that we can do it, that um, laws have been passed, things have changed. Therefore, research and the abuse of, um, say, a a doctor's uh, privilege which rarely happens. Um, so that is the main reason why I joined clinical research or would like to change is the, the face of clinical research. Um, so I want people to see like I'm a brown girl working in clinical research and that um, if we want to pass this drug that works for 95% of America's population, we need African-American people to be represented in that clinical trial. So that's why I'm here to help that transition get, you know, be more smooth. So that's one thing I would like to change. And that is awesome. That is, and like you said, you don't even think about that. You know, I, mm-hmm. I've heard about the Tuskegee um, experiment and all that, but you know, it's like, man, that can happen today, you know, and we don't even know it. So it's great. You are grateful to have someone like you in there to I mean, watch out, you know, and then it's like, <laughs> hey, that's not, that's not right. You know, we need someone on our side because, mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing stopping them. You know, there's, there's, protocols and rules and laws mm-hmm. that should be stopping them. But, you know, if people have an agenda set, they'll find a way to get it across. And so I just think mm-hmm. people are there to help us see yeah. that. So, oh, <laughs> ladies, this is just so awesome. This is great. And I'm learning how to add stuff. When you guys talk, I can put your article by your names and stuff. I'm like, this is Oh. <laughs> 
fancy. Yes, fancy. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, like so. Now, someone that's going in either in your field or just in the field of STEM, what would be mm -hmm. some tips and advice you would like to offer them? Because we know it's not easy. But what are some, you know, this like in in hindsight, you know, it's always twenty twenty. But as you're in it now, what would be some tips and advice you would want to help someone that's coming behind you? And so, Sharice, once again, we'll start with you. I think my most realistic tip would be to dream outside of your race. Um, and I say that because, you know, even though we want to help others, we're in that weird generational bridge where our parents, well, at least on my end, um, were so caught up with feeding us that they themselves were just working, you know? Like for us, mm -hmm. we're able to dream bigger dreams. And so we're mm -hmm. in that cusp where most millennials are breaking that barrier and versus, you know, just being you know, the ones doing the brunt work, we're not the ones who are stepping outside of our zones because we're able to dream. Like, um, I talk about the plant, but the hard thing to say is that we're the line workers, we're not the engineers. Whenever I walk into a plant, we're the ones doing the line work or, you know, janitorial mm -hmm. staff or, and it's not because we're not capable, but it's because sometimes our dreams are subsided based on who's speaking to us. Um, going through graduate school, I was told so many times, um, maybe you don't need this. Um, maybe you're trying to do too much. <laughs> and, you know, the worst thing I think I heard was, um, go work and come back. Oh. Mm -hmm. I was told, why do you need a PhD? I'll let you master out. Wow. And it's because we're told to just dream a little bit lower. We're told, you know, and it's, it's a sad mm -hmm. reality that, you know, when you're in a class and you're something, I'm, I've really always been the only one in the room. And it's because I've been stubborn <laughs> why I've been able <laughs> to do different things. So my advice would be to dream outside of your race, to dream for the next thing, to wish for the next thing, to hope for the next thing. And I'm just so happy we have social media now because it gives us a chance to actually see ourselves in a light that we may not have been taught to right. see ourselves in previously. And I know um, I'm a triple minority. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm from the Caribbean. We're Black, we're female. <laughs> so I have an even harder time most days when... I can't find my culture, you know, in the areas that I'm stepping into. Wow. And so Think about it's, that. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's always a constant struggle for me. And what that has taught me is well, as you're reaching back, give them a realistic vision of what we can really do. My best friend's a doctor now. We grew up together back home and, you know, she's a medical doctor. And I see people doing things like you ladies. And that's just what I want everyone else to see. Hey, you got to get her on here. Please send her her information. <laughs> we, we would love to have her on here. Come on, some station. Come I'll, 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 I'll forward you forward to her. <laughs> All right. Yes, yes. All right, Kelly, how about yourself? Let's see. So for me, I would say, you know, do your best to be more than just a name on a sheet of paper. I tell my students right. now, a 4.0 GPA, that's not enough. It's not enough to just be smart anymore. So mm -hmm. professionally, for me, getting involved in different organizations, networking was key for me because I wanted people to just to have a face to go with the name and to have a chance to interact with me and not actually just judge me based on a sheet of paper. I wanted them to know that I am smart. I am personable, you know, I'm approachable and I'm a hard worker. Mm -hmm. And so I would volunteer for a lot of positions that most people laughed at me and would say, why in the world would you do that? So I'll give you an example. At our crime lab, we had a tour coordinator position. And basically this person would literally just walk people around the lab to show them the facilities. And most people were like, why in the world would you want to do that? <laughs> I mean, we're all very busy. Um, but I saw it, you know, as an opportunity to get to talk to people and to get to know people. And I met so many important individuals who poured into me uh, just through those few interactions. So professionally, that was that was an amazing experience for me. I wasn't really looking for anybody to give me anything. I just wanted to learn. I wanted to interact with people. I wanted them to know me. And that was that was awesome. And then academically, one thing I don't see a lot of my students of color doing, which I wish they would, and I wish someone had told me to do this, is when you start school as a freshman, you should be doing your best to get to know your faculty from day one. 
schedule appointments with them, ask them, you yeah. know, what kind of research are you doing? Is there anything I could do to help you? And as an undergrad, I didn't do that because I was the only black person in my entire chemistry class. And so I was, I was intimidated to talk to my faculty. I didn't feel, you know, very wanted. But um, now as a professor, I see that those students who are right there around the faculty all the time, when those opportunities pop up, they're the first, they're the first ones to get dibs on it. They so of, yeah. if they, you know, they have a, some internship where they need a response by the end of the day, they're going to go to that student that they know already, that they know is reputable, that they can trust, that they have a relationship with. So I would definitely, you know, recommend for students to do, to do that as well. That's awesome. Um, and I love you say that we definitely need to have some advocates. And I think Marianne, let me get her back on. But um, and advocate for yourself. And so I did put your um, quote up there, but I had a little misspelling, so I had to go back. But um, and then you had some people that had some great things to say about you, and so I had that go across as well. Um, and I want to find the person, Sierra Elliott. She said, Kelly Knight is an amazing STEM enthusiast and I love working with her. So, hey, Sierra. <laughs> yeah, so this is just awesome, ladies. And uh, Marlena, you're back. I know we had some technical yeah. difficulties, but she's back. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys are giving awesome tips and I'm like typing them up and they're coming up. And so this is something that I just, just this is what I envision. Us on here, as you can see, is for, you know, we all in different um professions, careers, different stages mm -hmm. of life, different shades of brown, all this black girl magic, this melon popping. And then we're giving, you know, real advice and, and, and letting mm -hmm. people understand that it's not easy. And some of the things that we go through, because I used to say when I didn't think about professors, you know, I'm just knowing the teacher role to K through 12, but I'm like, oh, why? She's like, some of them get out to 10 and then, oh my, you know, like I don't even think about that when yeah, I'm complaining, I get out at three and I'm like, Oh, ten? like, oh my God, like, I didn't think about yeah. that. So this is mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. This is awesome. All right, Marlena, your turn. Um, tips and advice. So yeah, so um, Dr. Knight, you are so correct about taking on the opportunities and, um, you know, uh, like I tell people when I mentor all the time is networking will get you far. So always take those opportunities that you might not see everybody else doing, but it gives you um, a one up on, uh, say, your your opponent, or your app, your um, your peers. Um, so another thing I would like to express is don't be afraid to be yourself um, and know that you're deserving. I think um, oftentimes. Excuse me, as Sarish was saying, oftentimes we're told what we can't do and um, what what seems easier instead of showing us what the difficulties may be and how to get over our challenges, we're told to go the easier route. And so it's just knowing who you are, knowing what you can do and going for that. And if you so happen to fail, that that is part of the process. So you use that as part of your process. You don't use it as a crutch. You don't use it as something that holds you back. You say, hey, I've learned this lesson. What can I do better? And let's move forward. So um, that that is very important. I always say to stress that network, 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 because I would not be where I am today if I did not take on mm -hmm. those networking and internship opportunities. That is so true. That is so true. Yes. If I could just say one more quick thing since you brought it to mind, my last piece of advice would be to test your boundaries and to see mm -hmm. what you like. So many times we just do what looks good and then we can't push through the struggle because we haven't tested ourselves yet. You know, while you're younger, get out there. If you want to be a dentist, look at a dentist. See what they do. Ask to shadow them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want to be a, you know, a scientist, mm -hmm. see who's doing it. Because you might do it and not like it, or you might do it and find something else you love even more. So make your Correct. passion your career and know that it is your passion because you've tried it. Yeah, that is so true. You're, you're committing to a lifelong <laughs> journey with whatever career you choose. <laughs> so. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this as well um, is because sometimes we do get like, Oh, everyone said I was good at math, so I should be this or I should do this. And then sometimes we take on what other people project on us and we stuck in that that in that lane. And we're like, like you say, test your boundaries. You might not even like that. And I know, like, um, I think it was Marlena, you said you just knew you was gonna be a doctor, you know, a physician, and then <laughs> when you in the clinical research side, you're like, Oh, I like that a little bit more, you know, and so and it's okay, and people need to understand. 
That's okay. why, and especially in college, that's where you're supposed to test out. Try right. this, try that. Like I took an art class, an art history class, and I was like, this is gonna be, I'm just gonna get this little credit. And I love that class. I was like, oh my God, you know, and never was interested in art, was terrible mm -hmm. trying to draw anything, but you never know what you might be interested in. And so even my daughter Nyla, we were just out meeting with someone, Shivanti, and I think Kelly, you know, Shivanti Archer. And we were saying, and she didn't want to try the ice cream with the uh, syrup on it. And I was like, you have to at least try it once. And she said, well, I did. She said, you have to try it again because you never know what might have changed. And so for her to be a person, so she's listening to what I'm telling her, and, you know, because she doesn't like to try stuff. And so for her now at four to be like, test your boundaries, try things. You might like it now. You might have tried it mm -hmm. once and had a bad experience. Mm -hmm. Try it again. And I'm like, hey, that is so, you know, that just like ding, ding, ding. So that is a community-based thing too. Like fear is inflicted on you sometimes. Like projection oh. is crazy. Oh. If that person's afraid of something and they make you, well, because they're afraid, no, that, you're not, you might not be afraid to, but they're projecting their fears onto you. <laughs> so It's so true. And that's something like, even when you're going into business or trying something new, mm -hmm. you almost have to be careful who you tell your baby to or expose your baby to, because they'll be like, but that'll never work. That's crazy. And then you'd be like, you're right. And then you don't do it. And you never know because of fear. And it's not even, even your fear. It was somebody else's fear. And then you start like, no. So, yeah. Well, this is <laughs> awesome, ladies. Um, I want to ask about your families. Let's talk about families now. Because we didn't get here by ourselves. I know we have great <laughs> family influence, whether it was growing up or the family that's surrounding us. Now, and even friends, we call it, it's our family influence or people that you work with. So let's talk about family influence. And then our next last question will be future goals and giving back. So you want to, but I just love this. We just have great people are talking and, and comments are going back and forth. And I just think this is so great. <laughs> awesome. All right. So um, family mm -hmm. influence, let's talk about that. Cause that's something in the, you know, especially in the, um, our community, STEM community, and just being women of color community mm -hmm. that we definitely need that family influence and whether they influence us. We're influencing them. Let's talk about it. So, Cerise, you're up. Well, I think I said before, you know, I was raised in a single parent household. My mom is an educator. And so she's always been very strategic, I want to say, whether she knows it or not. <laughs> so yeah. it was like, let's do this actual activity. Let's go here. Let's go there. You know, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's church. On Tuesday, Thursday, it's Steel Pan. On Friday, it's Jazz Band Concert Band. <laughs> and at first, I was like, what is she doing? <laughs> but you know, as I got older, I kind of realized that she was preparing me for uh, a life without boundaries. So if you've tried things and you know what you don't like, you know, if you begin to work hard now, then work becomes a part of your work ethic. And so I always charge my mom and, you know, I tried, but I've had aunts and uncles <laughs> in the church and you know, they stuck with me, like I told you prior. And so my family is my community. I've, mm. I grew up in the church where, you know, if my aunts in the church saw a flyer for a program, it's coming to my mom <laughs> for her yeah. to sign me up. <laughs> and so I love that because that translated to my high school community. My friends from high school are still my best friends to this day. You know, if something has to happen or a career choice or I'm going up for an interview, <laughs> they will be the ones saying, hey, we're calling with some questions tonight, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And so my family is just that of the biggest group of love I could ever find in my life. <laughs> and no matter where mm -hmm. I am in the country, they keep me grounded. They support me. They make sure that I am where I need to be, you know? And so and that, well, I, have, I, I need I family. Have, <laughs> yeah, they're on somewhere. I grew up with two sisters, you know, one's a nurse, one's um, a, a chemist. So they all work in different fields where we're all just three sisters who do STEM, <laughs> thanks to my mom. <laughs> and so, yeah. That's awesome. All right, Kelly, let's talk about your family. Yes, and your family influence. Yeah, I have a, I have a really, really close-knit, probably unusually close-knit family. Um, I'm married, have two boys, and um, I have two older sisters, and we all live within 10 minutes of my mom. My wow. Mom. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, oh, wow. It's, uh, it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, some people are probably like, that's a little weird, but um, no, we're really, really, really close-knit family. Actually, my aunt and uncle and my cousins also, we all live within like about 15, 20 minutes. I love that, time. And, and, yeah, What's that it's, time? It's, it's, we have our own little <laughs> community right here but yeah talk about you know fear being in, uh, put upon you you know having my family they 
kind of do the exact opposite, which has been great. So like, you know, when I, when I decide I want to do something that the world considers crazy, I, <laughs> I have my family there to say, you can do it, you know, go for it, try it, you know? And so having that support, um, especially from my husband being married now and, you know, still trying mm-hmm. to do things and further my career. And he has never once said, you know, maybe you shouldn't do that. Or, you know, just having, having people in your corner to just kind of help fuel your passion and say, you know, you got this. And if not, then we'll figure it out then. But, you know, at this point you have it. So I think that was really instrumental in getting me to where I am, especially, you know, with my parents, like I mentioned, my mom was a teacher, my dad was in aviation. And if they hadn't taken that time when I was younger to, you know, try to encourage me to look at different career options and to, you know, really encourage me to be in STEM and to, and to put in the work, you know, to help. Ooh, Cause it's, as a parent, I can tell you Dale, <laughs> it is hard work when you're trying to put, when you're trying to help your kids with pursuing things, it means you're taking, you know, time away from you day in and day out mm-hmm. because you're trying to pour into them. And as a parent, mm-hmm. I can really appreciate that. Now, as I try to expose my sons to different things and I realize how much time it takes, I look back at my parents and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I just want to hug them and love them. Like, I'm so yeah. sorry. Because, because you guys gave everything for me to. Oh, I think she froze. Yes, I, I think she froze. And there she goes. But yes, oh my God, it's being a parent and, you know, you, you look back and you look at your mom and dad and be like, I thank you. I know. I, you know, like, we, don't, we didn't believe it. And they tried to tell us, you wait, you'll see. You're like, nah, whatever. I tell you everything. I'm, I'm grown. And then still to this day, I be like, mommy. I be calling mommy. She's like, what? Exactly. Exactly. I called call my mom more now than when I was in school. <laughs> like, mommy, what? Yeah, I call her so much more now. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy. Yes. And then when you start having your kids and you're like trying to tell them and they're just hard headed, you're like, you'll see. Right. <laughs> Right. But it is hard. All right. All right, Marlena, tell us about your family influence. So it's great to hear that I'm not the only one with the crazy big family. Um, oh, so I'm to talk about you all together like that. Yes. Yes. I have a crazy big family that thinks that if you put your mind to it, you can do it. And they're there to support you, even if they think it's a silly idea. They're going to put on their clown faces, too, and be out there supporting you. So, OK. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for my family. I mean, I love them to death. And so um, my immediate family consists of my mother and my sister. I was also raised by a single mother. So um, I had two moms. I I love to say Um, my older sister lives about 20 minutes from me and I have a niece. Um, So we're very close knit. Um, And so I know that if I want to do anything that um, my sister has my back, even my niece has my back. And um, my mom has my back. And so I grew up with wonderful aunts and uncles. Um, Like I said, my aunt just recently on a family vacation was like, well, what we got to do to get this doctorate going? (laughs) You know, like um, what what I need to do. Um, So I'm all so my family's always there. Um, I have a wonderful um, we affectionately call each other the um, village here in Texas. I live in Texas Mm -hmm. and it's a group of um, friends that have gone to school together or have met along the way. And we're just a big um, happy family we do things together we support each other and um i can't stress enough how i am surrounded by other african-american women that are i mean amazing in their right like um dr jasmine ward she was just on here she um not just on here but she made a comment (laughs) she's um She's amazing. Um, so she's part of the network. I have other amazing friends that are just doing amazing things. So um, it's kind of hard for me to sit back and just not do nothing. I mean, when you have so yeah. many amazing people around you, you're like, OK, so what can I do next? And even right. on here, I can, yeah, I can tell you women here, even on here, it is amazing. And it almost brings me to tears because. I grew up around a lot of amazing women and to see that you all are still out there doing your thing without any recognition. It, it just it it makes me know that my niece still has people outside of me that she can look up to. Um, so just I love it. Thank you, ladies. I know. right? <laughs> That's That's right. Right. That's <laughs> awesome. Yes. Yes. All right. Ladies, so we're getting close to the end. So we're going to combine these two questions. And so. And so the question <laughs> is basically and I think they go together your future goals and how you plan on giving back. 
And I know as you guys were just talking, we can already tell how you're giving back and paying it forward and all that great stuff. But what are your future goals? And I know Marlena, her aunt is already like, well, where's this doctor? When we get in this doctor? <laughs> yeah, but what are your goals? So, um, Sharice, we'll start with you. And like I said, this is our last question. So any last things you need to say, but this is your future goals and how you plan on giving back. Well, um, <laughs> I believe in rest and relaxation too. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. you know, just renewing the spirit, renewing the soul. I believe in all of it. <laughs> and um, yeah. I completed my PhD recently. But holistically, futuristically, I would like to get into um, academia eventually. That's one of my long term goals. So, hey, Kelly, I'll come talk to you later on. <laughs> um, but career wise, um, I'm looking for a change. You know, I'm, I'm seeking to figure out how to um, get into management. Okay. So there's always that. But on the side, one of my biggest goals is to figure out how to, to, how to engage more um, females in STEM. I've been working with my sorority a lot um, as far as just our various STEM programs and like things like that. And there's still so much more that can be done for our environment. So I'm seeking to also figure out a way to increase our initiatives back home. I do a lot of speaking when I'm there and I go to different different schools. I go back to my old, you know, classrooms and I speak a lot, but there is just something missing and I can't figure out exactly what it is right now. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm working towards finding an initiative where, you know, we can have a safe space for our various um, students to find their niche. Like um, just, I went to an HBCU back home, UVI. Um, you know, when I was there, I started Nesby. Um, I started different initiatives there. And I just, yeah, we didn't have, <laughs> there were a lot of things we were missing, but you know, we're working to just recharge that aspect of it. And so my goal is to figure out further ways to go back and give back and just to pull up the opportunities that are there to meet the standards of America and supersede as far as giving our students some ground to run, you know? So awesome. career wise, application wise, yeah. That's awesome, that's awesome. All right, Kelly, your turn. What are your future goals? Yeah, so I apologize in advance if my phone cuts out because it looks like it keeps freezing. Okay, that's okay. Know if it freezes up. But um, I actually did it backwards. So I'm in academia, but I'm hoping to get a PhD. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm blessed to be in a field that actually the, prime, uh, the majority of people in forensic science uh, actually have master's degrees. And so we're considered mm -hmm. a specialty field. And so okay. a lot of the people that you find in academia with forensic science often have masters because we've been practitioners and then we come back to teaching. Um, but I don't have to get a PhD. Um, my department is fine with me having a master's, but um, you know, being the type of person I am, it's not yeah. enough for me now. I know, and I'm sure. I <laughs> yeah, I realized that I want to have an impact on diversity and inclusion and teaching practices from a higher administrative level. And the only way I'm mm -hmm. going to be able to do that is with a PhD. A master's is fine in my department, but if I ever want to move up and have an impact from the higher level, I'm going to have to do that. So I'm going to um, I'm going to pursue a PhD in higher education with a concentration in science education research. Oh, so love actually Yes. Uh, I am in the process of studying for my GRE now because apparently I'm too old. The and school expired. <laughs> expired. I don't count anymore. Expired, I yeah. went through that process. <laughs> yeah. So y'all pray for a sister because I'm doing this process all over again. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I have a new appreciation for it. I, I love this field and mm -hmm. I love what mm -hmm. I'm going to be studying. And so it doesn't feel like a burden to me. I actually, exactly. I'm kind of nerding out. Like I'm enjoying studying the vocabulary words, which is weird. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my, <laughs> that's my future goal. Um, and then in terms of, you know, giving back to others, you know, Muhammad Ali says service to others is the rent we pay for Ooh, our running your own yes. That's really all I'm trying yeah. to do. I'm very mm -hmm. passionate about that. We have camps for girls, um, females of color and those underrepresented in STEM mm -hmm. at Mason. And I am just trying to give back a portion of what was given to me. Um, sadly, I didn't really get a true mentor until I got to graduate school. That was the first time that I really felt like I had <clears throat> who was in my corner and was pushing me to, you know, to accomplish everything I could. And I don't want other girls of color to ever experience that. I want them to know at 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, that they can see themselves 
in someone like me, that they can see, you know, someone who is actually being successful in STEM and, you know, that encourages them. And so I'm just trying to do the little bit I can in order to help out with that. Awesome. Yes. Ladies, this is so awesome. All right, Mylena, <laughs> what are your future goals? I mean, these are just, wow, this is just nine more and I love it. Yes. Yeah. Well, Kelly, that little bit that you're going to do is going to go a long way. Believe me, it's not little. Mm -hmm. it has exactly. A exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So, of course, um, I'm looking into uh, a, another degree. Um, I was toying with the PhD, actually, you know, kind of got a conditional um, entrance, but I decided to go an MBA route. This is very oh. random, but <laughs> okay. my job. Definitely yeah, my job opened too. up this opportunity and um, I get to travel overseas and um, take a coursework there. So I think I'm going to go with an MBA. So I have two masters um, by the end of probably oh, 2021. So, yeah, I know about the GRE, Kelly. Oof. I Girl. Just, yeah. <laughs> well, she relates good luck. All <laughs> right. Yeah, good luck. That'd be yeah. great. Yeah. That'd be great, yeah. So I want to continue. So I guess um, as far as like professional, I really want to be director of clinical operations. I want to see it from the top all the way down to the bottom. Um, that is my goal. I do like academia as well. Um, so that's also, you know, I'm toying with that, too. I feel like we we're we're young enough that we can actually do anything. I could teach. I could um, be a director of clinical operations. You know, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to wear many hats. Um, and I'm going to continue with my community outreach by doing Science Saturdays. I I am a blessed auntie of eight. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, eight or nine. I, I, I lose the count because it's mostly girls and I have one boy. So um, I do science projects with them. And so I'm going to continue to do that because I love to introduce them to um, science. I mean, to watching their eyes light up and that they do these experiments on their own with a little help from me and their parents. So I want to continue to do that and I'll hopefully turn that into a um, STEM focused uh, summer camp because I noticed here um, in Texas, there's not really a lot of STEM focused camps. If they are, they're very limited. So I want to broad that out, you know, where it's, it's a full on camp. That is awesome. Wow, ladies. And one thing I love that Marlena said, we're young enough, and I'm even including myself in that, that <laughs> yes. you can do whatever. And just to hear you guys mm -hmm. say, hey, I can do this, I can do that, I might do this. Sky's the limit. And that's what we yeah. want our viewers and our young ladies that are coming up to know you don't have to stay in just this particular lane that someone puts you mm -hmm. in. And you can right. just go this way. And like Marlena said, I'm going to go for NBA. Why not? Hey, I get to go for Steve. <laughs> They're going, right. you know, like, why not? And that's what we need to do more of mm -hmm. instead of saying, not me, or I can't do it, or that's going to be too hard, or who's going to support me? It's like, why not? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. I'll go for it. So that is awesome. And I love that Mia Elliott said, God has already set the path, just walk in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I just want to say, this has been awesome, ladies. Thank you so much for giving us this full hour of enrichness. We made an hour and we had kept our viewers and we had um, interaction. So I know that this has just impact a lot of people and like just with the camps that you guys want to do, that's the stuff that you're doing every day, just walking in your truth and your light. I just thank you again for being here and just sharing your journey. And an hour is not enough to just talk to you. Through right. that. So I know we'll be, you know, Say, hey, let's do a follow up to see what you guys are doing now because you were just yeah. so awesome. And then, especially mm -hmm. when we're doing the camps and stuff, if you want to come back on and just tell us about okay. it. If we can do some outreach as well with you guys. Feel free mm -hmm. to use us and you help use our platform and let's partner up and let's do things. Because it's time, ladies. We are no longer hidden figures. We are out in the open and we're walking our truth in life. So I love mm -hmm. it. So I just want to say thank you. Um, I'm for one more comment. J, uh, JT Smith said, "Wow, ladies, you all are, are you all are amazing. Yes, I can see it myself. So I just want to tell everyone out there that are watching and the ladies that are here, have a sensational, sensational uh, Saturday, Sunday, and um, since we missed, we had your spotlights on Saturday as well. But have a sensational Sunday. Have a sensational week. We thank you guys for being here." And just walk in your truth and light and just keep it up. And um, we definitely keep that spotlight on you guys because you guys are doing awesome. So 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having us. Yeah. Check out Thank you for articles. having us. Their articles are embedded there in the comments. Um, we're also on our Facebook, Instagram pages. I'm sure they're going to be um, showing them and sharing them. And share this video. Share this out. Comment. The more, more people to see it, the more light we can bring to what we're trying to do. So thank you, guys. And um, we're going to call it a night. It's been real. Thank it's you. Real. Bye. Bye. One more blessings to you all. Excellent ladies. Mia Elliott said, I had to get that one in now. <laughs> okay, so, Bye. Ladies, you stay right. for a second. Let me end the broadcast. Okay.